Gabe, we're just gonna, you know, talk about life, yeah. love, basketball, the pursuit of happiness. I would like to focus on life and love. There's nothing better to talk about, truly. Hello and welcome to episode 45 of the Long Shot Podcast. I'm your host, Duncan Robinson, and I am here as always with my good friend and co-host, Davis Patrick Reed. Davis, how are we doing? I'm great. I'm great. How are you, Dunk? I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, we're, we're changing up the pace on everybody. Uh, just a little public service announcement. We're just going to hit you with a short intro here. We're going to get right to the the meat and potatoes of this episode, mm. which is a fantastic interview uh, with Gabe Namdi Vincent. And then you you know if you want to stick around after after the interview, uh, you can listen to Davis and I just basically blab and 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 you know talk a whole lot of nothing basically. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. Like you said, the meat and potatoes, which is Gabe Vincent. Also, sh- this is an opportunity to shout out Blue Wire, Dunk, because they've been doing mm. a really good job of putting timestamps in our descriptions. So for Love all that. you guys that that just tune in, because I see this, some people tune in just for the interviews, Dunk. They don't want to hear us go back and forth. Right. Guess what? It's your happy day. We're going to get straight to that. You could even skip this part if you want to. I bet it's going to tell you right when the Gabe Vincent part starts. For those of you that don't care at all about our interviews and just want to hear Duncan and I talk about nothing, because surprisingly, there are a couple of those people too. You can do wow. that as well, but you're going to have to wait a little bit longer and skip the Gabe interview, which I do not recommend doing. Um, I definitely do not recommend doing that because Gabe had a whole bunch of gems uh, on life, basketball, uh, adversity on, off the court, everything in between. And uh, you know, I just think it's a, it was an interview, a conversation, really, that I think uh, a lot can be taken away from. I certainly learned a lot. Yeah, as did I. Um, so anyways, here's Gabe Vincent. Welcome back in to the Long Shot Podcast. We have a very special guest, uh, a dear, dear friend of mine, a dear teammate of mine as well. Gabe Vincent, how are we feeling over there on the other end? Debo, I've never really felt better, to be honest with you. I'm honored to be on the podcast. Uh, Been looking forward to it. Been a big fan thus thus far. Excuse my language. Um, I'm just excited to have a good time with you all. No, I, I fully anticipate uh, that this is going to be a, a fantastic time. I love the statement that you're coming in. Uh, for those that are watching on YouTube, he, he's got the uh, the two chain. Uh, shout out to your number two, as well as a, a beautiful pea coat. Um, that, that's one thing this year that I've, I've been really impressed with. You've really brought uh, a new level of of energy and commitment to your pregame fits, and like not just pregame, just like every single day as well. Uh, I just appreciate your dedication to it. I really do. I, I just truly tried to take uh, the the contract as like a, just a level up in life. You know, I felt like I needed to take myself a little more serious when I left the house. So you know, I, I put a little more effort into my my outfits, especially pregame. Uh, but on these off days where we get the whole day in the city, I've tried to really just enjoy it. You know. No, I've, I've, I've definitely noticed that. Is there anyone that you uh, look to for inspiration? You know, just uh, um, uh, somebody like a, a vet that's really kind of paved that path for you? Not really. I mean, a lot of the vets I've seen lately kind of do some, I don't want to say outlandish, but it's just a little too bold for my taste, I think. So maybe I try to find that happy medium. I don't no, want to say look at them at, like what not to do, but. Maybe just not my style as much, you know. No, no, I, I think you do a great job. I think you you walk that line of being very, very clean uh, with mm. your approach, uh, while still, you know, occasionally kind of dabbling and in, in stepping out outside of that a little bit. Um, and quite honestly, I, I think that actually ties in beautifully with your game as well. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, you know, you you have a lot of game. You're solid. You're a solid, yeah. reliable uh, ball handler. But every now and then, you know, you might mix in like a a Dame step back. You know, something with a little uh, bit more flair. Uh, and, and I yeah. see a lot of crossover there between how you dress and how you play. Is that something you ever thought about? Like a little pop of color here and there is kind of just like a here's a quick highlight, and then I'm back to just being solid. Yeah, you know, steady. I mean, yes. I've never thought of it that way, but it's quite applicable now that you put it that way. No, it, it is. And, and that's one thing that I've noticed throughout this year, uh, obviously being you know a close observer, somebody who's a part of your day-to-day practice games, workouts, everything in between. I've noticed your comfort level skyrocket. 
And, you know, Absolutely. earlier in the year, maybe last year, you were that solid, reliable piece. You're going to come in, you're going to pick up 94, you're going to be disruptive, you're going to take care of the ball. And now all of a sudden we're seeing, we're seeing like some UCSB Gabe Vincent in flashes, you know, like, like I'm not afraid to go yeah. get one type of thing. Uh, right. and, and quite honestly, as a, as a teammate and a friend, uh, it's inspiring and, and I love to see it. I really do. I, I mean, it's great to hear that it's encouraged by, I mean, I consider you a vet, Dunk. I don't know if you consider yourself a vet, but <laughs> wow. I mean, in my eyes, I mean, I'd say you're, you're on that. Maybe you're walking that line. I think you're more towards the vet side. So that means a lot coming from a vet. I'll tell you what, man, that's a, that was somewhat of a special moment. I haven't been referred to a, as a vet uh, all too often. I feel, you know, I still feel young, you know, I'm, I'm 27 years old, uh, but, but I really do feel young. I'm, I'm curious for your sake, you know, I, I, I'm joking around about you getting more comfortable and, and, you know, throwing in the, the step backs and the tween tweens, all that sort of stuff. But like, was there kind of a moment where you started to kind of feel more and more comfortable you know, to, to play with the ball in your hands and be aggressive in that sense. You know, it's, it's interesting. Cause I mean, I guess it started last year when, uh, I mean, you remember that those games in Philly, like we had guys out COVID injuries, you name it. And there was like seven of us. And it was like, we're about to go against Joel and bead and the boys like on the road. And it was just like, like let's see how this goes. And, um, I made my first shot and it was just kind of like, and I kind of blacked out from there, ended up having a career high. And it was like, I could get used to this, you know, it's like, this is great. You know, let's go back to scoring the ball like I'm used to. And um, as guys came back, it was like a little bit of an adjustment, you know, getting back to, you know, having a role. Obviously, Jimmy's on the court. We're going to give Jimmy the ball and so forth with a number of other guys that are extremely talented. Uh, so kind of finding my role there and then. This year, it's been you know a little bit more into the fold, more in rotation. I've been able to find my my niche, I guess you could say, and be able to pick my spots a little bit better. No, you've you've definitely found it. And for those that don't know, I think four of your five career highs have all come against Philly. Is that right? I love Philly, man. <laughs> so what? Like it's, it's strange, even more so to go another layer. Debo is like it's really Doc Rivers. I think like my first big game. Was in LA against the Clippers, and it was That's like, right. was the like I hit my first three shots, which is like it, almost unheard of, kind of. I guess like just stepped into the game, never really, you know, big stage Staples Center at that time. No, like it wasn't crypto Staples, so it was like I'm, I'm my my boy is courtside, my boy JD's courtside. I'm just in there, not expecting I'm going to play. We're at the trade deadline. It's like guys just got traded, and it's like threw me in the game second quarter. It was like made my first three shots and doc was over there just mad. Like, who is this kid? Like, why do we not know who he is? And he's lighting us up. It was, it was a, it was a special moment for me. I think. No, that was, that was legitimately a special moment for all of us. Also, I'll point out, uh, Shout out to J JD Slacker. He's a friend of all three of us here. Uh, David yeah. is, a, is a Phillips Exeter alum and knows JD quite well. Absolutely. He loves to remind me of the state championships. Oh, 100%. New England championships, but, you know, we're not going to pick Harris here. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, JD, JD's a legend. Gabe, I'm interested. You've now brought this up twice, hitting your first shot, hitting your first three shots, how that steam rolls into a hot night. You're, I, I've, I read a quote, I think it was from Eric Glass, about how you were a total gunner in the G League. I think you referred to you as Absolutely. Jordan Clarkson of the G League. But is that... I don't necessarily like the comparison, but yeah, I, he said it. But, for so sure. I, I imagine when that's your role, it doesn't matter if your first five shots miss or not they're going to continue to go up i imagine that changes a little bit though when you're with the heat are you one of those guys who okay first couple shots go in i'm going to keep being aggressive or is it not impacting you at all you know i think uh with the way our our team is built i think i, I have to keep in mind that it doesn't impact me too much um obviously if we have guys out i know there's more shots to be taken but um a lot of, I think, what I bring to the to our team is making an open shot, but being able to facilitate and, and find guys and, and get other guys going, you know, because we have a lot of the guys that can score the ball and fill it up. And, uh, you know, when I come in bringing that defensive edge and being able to play make, which is something I've, I've grown a lot in over the last couple of years, I think that's something that, that keeps me on the floor. And when I make an open shot, it's like a, a bonus, you know what I mean? So. Uh, when I get hot, obviously I, I love it. It's great. It's like extra points or 
um, like the cherry on top of the cake in some ways for us. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm curious. I want to hear you expand a little bit on your kind of change as, as a player. And, and I know a lot of it has been development and, and we'll get to that, but I'm curious a little bit more so behind the thought process of your actual play style in that when I first got to know you, what you were, how you were playing in the G league was you were running off of screens. You were letting it fly. You were kind of like a, a Jordan Clarkson type in that sense. And that's no, no shade to, to JC. Obviously he does, he does it at a high level, but now the, the kind of disposition that you have when you step on the, on the floor is a totally different vibe. And, And I'm curious of like, just the your the mental approach to it to making that adjustment in order to stick and in order to to fit and have a role in the nba yeah i mean it's been tough it's strange because everyone always looks at me now as like you're the scorer you've always been a scorer you need to be more of a point guard that's kind of how it was transitioning for like the tail end of last year and into this year uh but growing up initially i was the smallest kid i'd play up and it was like the smallest kid is naturally the point guard so like growing up, I was used to you make an open shot and you get in the paint and get other guys involved. Uh, and as I got older, I grew into more of a scorer. And I, I transferred schools in high school. They already had a point guard. I was trying to think of what's the easiest way to seamlessly fit into what's new here. You know, especially being in high school, you know, everyone's worried about fitting in in some way. So it's like if I can fit in on the team, I'll be all right. So we already had a point guard. I said, let me become more of a scorer, work on my game that way. And then that just started to come so natural that I just completely left being a PG and like worrying about everyone else on my team, like in the rear view, you know, and it was like, let me just be a defensive guy that can go get a bucket. And then college and G League. And then it's like I had that realization of being the G League of like, look, wherever I go, if I get a call, I'm probably not going to be a starter right away. You know, I told my coach, hey, let me come off the bench, come in and be aggressive. I'll earn my starting minutes through my minutes coming off the bench. And we could just go from there. And it kind of worked out great for me. Um, I don't want to say until I got to the heat, but once I got to the heat, I just was not shooting the ball at the same level I was in the G. And obviously that keeps you from playing that score, come off the bench and be a gunner role. And um, I found that, you know, we were lacking some playmaking and that's an area I needed to grow at. And a little bit in the bubble, actually, when I think K Nun was out, recovering from COVID, it was like, that's when I got my first reps with the heat at the one. And um, I just try to take as much advantage of it as possible. And I think they kind of saw the, the, the glimpse of like, I I could do this if molded the right way and then continuing to work with them and work with EG and break down film, study guys like Kyle, which is crazy enough that he's now, you know, our, our starting point guard that I've been able to pick his brain up close and personal. Um, you know, I've kind of grown into adding that truly being a true combo guard and being able to play on the ball and off the ball. Yeah, I think it shows a different level of just mental maturity, right? I, I think there's there's so many stories of guys, whether it be in the G League or, or even in college of like, man, I'm good enough. Like, I just need the, the right situation for like them to let me be me. And like yeah. in your case... Like it was like, no, I'm going to roll with the punches, see where the chips fall and whatever situation I end up in, I'm going to make the most of it by adjusting, adapting. Because I remember that stretch in the bubble of like you were on the scout team, you were handling every single possession. You were were getting to be the, the other team's, you know, key ball handler, playmaker, all that sort of stuff. And those were like reps where it's funny now looking at your game versus like what it was then and it's only like whatever it is a year and a half but like how much you've improved in that short stretch of time in those areas is crazy it really is it's crazy even something simple as like a pick and roll like or like just pushing the pace like i remember going into the some of those bubble practices like uh, fresh off watching kemba walker film like just in case we play the celtics like let's prepare Gabe, your Kemba today. And it was like, that's it, herky-jerky style. It's not even my game, but let's just try it out. like, And having some fun just ex- experimenting with that and, and getting that leeway and then just seeing how some of the games I'll play now, it's just like, it's night and day. It's almost like, it feels like it's been 20 years and so it's only been a year and a half. Do you feel like you've improved that much as a basketball player? Like you win most improved in the G League. 
do you feel like that's, wow, I've grown so much as a player or is it just, I'm starting to get comfortable. I'm in a situation that's starting to make more sense. Things are starting to slow down a little bit. I think it's a combo. I think things start to slow down and you get more comfortable, the more, the better you get, you know? And I think the, the more work I put in and started to try to find my niche, not just within this league, but within our team, then it was like, okay, I, I've kind of etched out a space here for where I could fit in and, and find success. And then as you start to find success through all the work you've been putting in, I think you just naturally become more comfortable and you start to really feel like, you know, Hey, I belong. Like I can do this. I bring something valuable to this team. Uh, and I don't know what night it, it might not be every night. It could be some nights. It could be no nights. But when I get my moment, I'm just going to try to take advantage of it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think one thing that I've definitely noticed as, as a teammate of yours is how you just handle your business day in and day out. And I mean, I think that if I could stress like one thing to to younger athletes, it's like it's that approach of taking it you know, every single day and understanding that like, look, whether I'm in the rotation, not in the rotation, like I'm going to show up, I'm going to get my work before I'm going to get my codes. I'm going to get my treatment. I'm going to take care of my body. So now for you, you know, because you've had stretches this year where you've been in out, whatever it was, obviously last year in out all that sort of thing, but correct me if I'm wrong, but like your approach has never changed. It's, it's always been the same and you've always kept that consistent. Like I'm going to show up and handle my business. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's not easy. I mean, I guess this question a lot of like, how do you feel about some games I was starting this year to not playing right. to being four or five minutes a game? Like, it's not easy. But like you said, that uh, the approach and the, the routines that I've built I had in place, like, if anything, I've only added to them, you know, and it's like falling back on those just help me to continue to be prepared for whatever minutes or situation I'm thrown into. And that's not saying necessarily I'll find a bunch of success when I'm in them. It's just, I, for me, I see it as the best way to be prepared. If I prepare like I'm starting every night, then I'm going to be in pretty good shape to go out there and give my best and give you guys my best, you know, because I don't want to let my teammates down in any shape or form, you know, regardless of what the playing time or the coaches are doing, I still want to be there for you guys. So it's like, whatever my time is, if it's no time, I just want to be my best version to be able to help us get a win on any night. Yeah, you, you talk about being in and out of the rotation. Um, obviously, you've had your fair share of adversity. And obviously, adversity comes in different forms. But, you know, whether it be in college, uh, you know, you had you tore your ACL, had a big time injury, you had injuries as a professional, uh, not getting drafted, spending time in the G League. All of that can be kind of framed as, uh, well, it is adversity. It's basketball adversity. I'm curious of, of for you, what has helped you kind of persevere through those setbacks and, and kind of maintain that level of consistency that you bring every day? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because OG talks about it a lot, about like just the way we work in Miami and the yeah. whole work ethic of the weight and body fat. You know, he, he says like once you really buy into it, it's just a lifestyle. And I think when he said that to me about the weight and body fat and the conditioning and staying in shape, like, I really resonated with that because that's how I approached all the adversities I faced. It was like, look, I could sit here and whine about it and complain about it and just like, you know, throw the finger up at the game for doing this, you know, and blame everybody else. Or I could just get back to work and give myself the best situation. Like you said earlier, wherever the chips fall, they fall. Um, and that's kind of been my approach. It's like, I'm just going to do the best I can, put myself in the best situation. If the chips fall and I fall short, then I fall short or back to the drawing board. Uh, so for me, it's just, I've just continued to try to stay true to that. Like I said, if anything, I've only added things to my routine and, and just go from there. So you think, you think you've had a lot of those habits prior to being in Miami, like, but it, it, more so that my, like you aligned with Miami Long time. and brought out your, your best version. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about 14, 15 AAU. Like I was the kid that had the bands in his suitcase stretching in the room and guys are like, what I are you doing? That. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I feel like I should be doing this, you know? And it's like, so in some ways, like, I felt like I've carried myself as a professional for a decade now. And it's like, I'm just now able to pay bills for it. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it's, that part is reassuring that it's paid off. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I've conducted myself somewhat professional like since a young age. Duncan referred to it earlier as mental maturity, Gabe. Uh, you, your parents were both psychologists. Is that right? Cause I think you speak, they are, you man. just, they're in my head. You have an aura about you that your parents were both psychologists. It seems like whatever's going on in between the ears is very healthy. I appreciate that, man. I, I know they'd appreciate it as well, but, um, they are both psychologists. My mom, my mom has her own practice. My dad actually runs a, a foster family agency now. He's a, he's a, he opened a business up, um, over a decade ago now running a foster family agency and, um, they've kind of collabed a little bit, but, um, they're definitely in my head. They know what I'm thinking. I haven't been able to get away with anything. You name it. Like they already know what I'm up to. I, I couldn't be sneaky as a kid. Like they already, they knew what I was scheming. I couldn't get away with a thing. Man. Were you a good kid? Did you get in trouble? I mean, you know, I was okay. I, I had a lot of energy and, you know, I, I tried to be sneaky. But like I said, they tended to, they, they caught me more often than they did not. Unfortunately for my sake. But I mean, it worked out, I guess. So maybe fortunately for my sake, they caught me. How much of that, like, curiosity of the brain do you think you've carried with you? I mean, we had a talk a little, like, a couple days ago, Doug. I think a lot. I think I get really curious sure. about what kind of makes people tick. And, I mean, as a, as a point guard especially, I think that's something that I've taken to heart is kind of just randomly asking guys, like, hey, one, one shot, you know, you have eight seconds. Where do you want the ball? Game seven of the finals, where would you like it? You know, Markeith Morris, where do you want? It? You know, just trying to just pick his yeah. brain of like, you know, how, you know, Tuesday at 11 a.m., like you get asked this question, you know, it's like, I feel like I'm just going to get the, the rawest, realest answer possible. And it's like, I start to just try to ask guys like where they would go to if the games on the line, you know, whether it's Markeith or Jimmy or Duncan, you want to come off to your right or your left, like, you know, or even if I'm just passing for you, Doug, I might throw you a bad pass just to see like how you move it. You know, are you going to bring it back to your pocket? You're just going to go up like, and whether or not it helps down the line, it might. So it goes, it goes beyond like your curiosity though, goes beyond basketball. Like I, like just today <laughs> we were talking about how like one of your favorite questions is like yeah. asking someone like, what are you most proud of? You know, like what are you I, most proud? Of? I love that. Like, that's like, and like, we're not talking like you would say that to me or whatever. Like you, you just like, you know, two minutes into a conversation with a stranger, you'll just be like, yeah, what are you most proud of? And, you know, like it's, taking, it's, taking it there is a beautiful thing, man. It really is. It's crazy because that question specifically, I actually got, I was getting a haircut from Jimmy's barber actually. And first question in the chair, he just, boom, what are you most proud of? And it really messed me up. Cause I've always been someone that loves deep questions like that, obviously, but a stranger in a chair, barbershop style, like that's not the question you get asked in a barbershop ever. You know, it's like, who's your favorite team? Where are you from? You know what right. I mean? Like you get questions surface like level. that. Surface level stuff. Yeah, surface. And if you get to a deeper level, you do. But when he hit me with that, it, it, so for me, what I loved about it is it sets the tone. Like I can tell a lot about a person by the way they answer it. Like if you give me some BS answer, like I'm most proud of, you know, you, just, you throw something out there. It's like, Okay, you want to keep this surface level. This is only right. as deep as this relationship's going to go. Cool. But others, you just open the door to like, you know, maybe they will give me a real answer and we can get into a, a serious conversation, you know. Wait, so can we answer so with it? That, with that yeah, with that being said, we got to know like what do you want? Yeah. yeah. I honestly this I don't want you to think this is cliché, but for me, I think my Olympic experiences and stuff with the national team has been incredibly moving for me. Not just the, obviously, to be able to say I'm an Olympian, even though we did not have much success, if any, in Tokyo, unfortunately. Um, just the fact to, to be able to represent my country um, and get closer to my, my culture in that way and be able to go back home in 2019 and, and compete in China and qualify for the Olympics, like that alone was an amazing experience that I'm incredibly proud of. And then you take on to the following year, you know, we play USA in Vegas and then move forward on to Tokyo. Like the experiences and things I've encountered just, just through that and through basketball in that way is just like, I could have never imagined that as a 10 year old kid or a 12 year old kid, you know, 
growing up, especially in the States, it was like, it's Team USA or nothing. And then having the opportunity as I got older to represent Nigeria, it was like, that just brought me so much closer to that side of my roots. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the Olympics. Um, Cause obviously we were, we were going to talk about it at some point, but and not to project what you should be proud of onto you. <laughs> but one thing that I will say that you entirely undersold is that I think you should be proud of the fact that on that team full of veterans who have played basketball at a high level, and this is not coming just from you, but other people that I've talked to who played on that team, how you were one of the basically two leaders of that team, the captains, the voice in the locker room uh, for somebody I just think it speaks volumes to who you are as a person and also the respect that you garner for how you handle your business. Because, you know, you got NBA players, guys that in theory on paper have more NBA experience than you or this, that, or third, whatever it may be. But for you to have the voice of that locker room um, and from this is not just coming from your account, but from other accounts that I've talked to, uh, everyone kind of felt that that was the case. So I think, and once again, not to project, but I think that is is for sure something that you should be proud of. Just wanted to, to say that. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. But like, talk, but but a little bit, if, if you will, and I, and I know you're a humble guy, so you know, you're yeah. not going to want to expand on this too much, but like talk a little bit about the process of like finding that voice because exactly like I said, like you're not necessarily the most decorated player in that locker room uh you got a guy like like ekbe who i think immediately ekbe udo gave you that stamp of approval um and, and from there from what it sounds like you just kind of took it in and ran with it but also earned it in many in many his respects. parents are yeah, psychologists I mean, first off, <laughs> yeah true he's just working the room is what it is he's just working yeah, the just working the room a little bit never hurts <laughs> i mean but no but doubling back like first off Epe, that's I consider him one of my vets, like one of my OGs. And, and me and Epe have gotten real close through this whole, you know, the whole st- even start in China, really. Like when we were there in 2019, like I started to just get him to the side, or he pull me aside and pick his brain, and we go back and forth. And it's crazy because this is full circle. Like I kind of broke down exactly what I thought I would need to do to get to where I'm at now. And it was almost like word for word, you know, you go down the timeline with what I was telling him, it's almost exactly what had happened. And it was like, when it did finally happen, like he was one of the first people to hit me. And we had talked about, he's like, look, you told me you were going to do X, Y, and Z. And it came to be like, you know, I'm proud of you, this, that, and the third. And my and his relationship has only grown um, since that first experience. But going into camp with Nigeria, I kind of knew what I needed to be for Miami. And I saw it as an opportunity to work on that too. You know, I, I knew that there's a possibility of if I'm gonna play on this team, I'm gonna need to be a backup one. So I need to be more vocal. I need to be able to run a team, push the pace, find ways to still be me while getting everyone else involved. So going into camp, I was incredibly vocal. I was like, let me try to just bring a lot of great energy, set the tone, and you know, no disrespect to Mike Brown at all. But the way Golden State runs things, as you know, Doug, is very different than the way we run things in Miami. So when we got to the competition stuff, I got a little more animated, probably more than than you've seen me. Probably more like the last our home games, our home stretch when Kyle wasn't here, when I'm talking crazy on the court and yelling. And it's like that's kind of how I was that first those first days of competition in that gym. And it's like that was a a kind of guy that those people haven't really seen. Like I'm talking crazy. They're talking about canceling the second practice of the day. And I'm like, man, we're here to work. Like F that everyone be back here at four o'clock. Like it's, it's go time. Like we're trying to do something. Let's lock in. And I kind of had that mentality going in of like, just so eager to prove that I could be what I'm doing now for Miami, that it was like, I was just so gung ho and so intense in that setting that it kind of just, naturally fell into place uh, with the guys that were trying to college, some of the college guys that were competing. And then as the, the European pros came in competing, uh, the other NBA players coming in competing, that it kind of just worked itself out that way to where without Mike and, and the coaching staff even needing to say anything, it was kind of unspoken that me and Epe were kind of the voices of the team. You know, Epe obviously having everyone's respect, his career speaks for itself. His, 
you know, all his accolades, EuroLeague, NBA, you go down the list, you know, there's not many situations he hasn't seen, um, you know, as, and being an older guy in our culture, like you name it, Epe was definitely up there. And I think I had slowly earned my voice through camp. And I, it was just a, it was a really cool experience for me. And uh, I was honored to, to have that label of, of captain and, and be able to represent my guys and in uh, our nation and, you know, and take that role on. But it was definitely a challenge, a little more than I, I thought I'd be taking on, I will say. You also beat Team USA, which is a, you know, that's just... I mean, yeah, I mean, who's going to remember that? Right. You know, as they get beat all the time, <laughs> right? Like, And you had like 20. That was legendary. That was, that was a fun game, bro. I mean, I can't, I can't lie to you. Like, that game was intense. You know, that was like the one game that weekend that was sold out. Obviously, we're playing USA and we're just like, man, who, like, we're going to the scouting report and I'm, I'm like, Doug, what's the scouting report look like? Like, blitz everybody like we're trapping everyone because they're all can go for 40 at any time like <laughs> what are we like what's the game like really what's the game plan look like you know i'm like going to this game like we know we got to get a stop every possession and score every possession like no matter how much we go up they can come back like it was crazy and, and for those who don't know how it ended you know gabe namdi vincent goes for a light what was it 20 or 21 what no idea it? Don't I, lie to me. Yeah, Come yeah, on. Know. You, know the, you know the full <laughs> line, bro. I know I, you know the full line. I think I, I think I knocked down a free throw at the end that might have made it 21. I'm not positive. I love it. I'm so Namdi goes, goes for a loud 21. Like everybody <laughs> hears it 21 to the point where it's just like, well, obviously everyone was just blown away by the fact that you guys beat them. But it wasn't like some flukish thing. Like I watched the game. You guys beat them. Like – like what we is, played a really good game, bro. You did. Like you you outplayed them a hundred percent. It wasn't flukish. What does your phone look like after <laughs> that game? Like I'm I'm genuinely curious. Out of battery. My <laughs> right. phone was going. And the, the craziest part about it, Dunk, was like so we win the game, right? That was crazy enough. And and just to totally go off track here, I go back to the locker room after a little, you know, post game interview, whatever, on the court radio. I go back to the locker room and it's, I'm expecting to walk into music and dancing and like water everywhere. Guys are just sitting there chilling, just like I am now on their phone. Like, just like it's a regular Tuesday. Like we didn't just be the quote unquote best team in the world. Like, and just put, you know, I mean, put hands on them. Like we were nowhere near supposed to be in that game, you know, on paper. I don't know what the line looked like betting wise, but I guarantee you it wasn't in our favor. And guys are just like, yeah, it's another day. Like, and when I walked into that, I was like, this is this is awesome. Like, you know, we came in this game ready to compete for a win. And, you know, we expected to to win if we did what we needed to do. And guys were all geeked, like just chilling there. Like, and then the cameras came in. It was like, all right, like, all right, we can, we'll get up and celebrate now. But it was just like, it was just whatever. But the phone was blowing up. And then you take the two days after, there was nothing else going on in the sports world. And it was right. just like Stephen A talking about it. And it was just like, he, we, like it, you couldn't get away from it. It's all that was going on on ESPN was how USA needs to make adjustments and how they got beat by, you know, they couldn't even say my name. They're, you know, my boy Caleb Agata, like the Caleb Agata, you know, the way Stephen A was saying it. Like, we <laughs> right. thought it was hilarious. Like, we kind of ran with it throughout the whole, the rest of our summer. But it was crazy, man. The attention we got after that game was, was insane. Does any part of you feel, disrespected by how surprised everyone was or do you understand how much of the underdog you are in that situation i think i think that's a fine line davis because like i get the underdog side of it being a pretty logical guy like i get it but i think the emotional side still feels some disrespect of For like sure. look it's still the game of basketball like we did what we had to do and we won the game like i, I get it y'all are shocked that we won because on paper, we shouldn't have won. You know what I mean? In a game, a best of seven series, like it could have been very different, but it's one game. And like on that game, we did enough to win the game. And it's like, for me, it's like, like we didn't get enough respect for that alone. Like we did a lot of things strategically that helped us win the game. Our staff did some good ATOs, did some good adjustments on, on defense, like switch this, we're going to blitz that. And I thought that just went completely in the rear view and it was all just about who didn't do what for USA, which obviously we're in the States and, you know, media is going to do what they're going to do. But 
I think uh, we did some good things in that game. Like Duncan said, I think we just outplayed them at the end of the day. Like we made shots when we needed to. We had some big time stops and, you know, it's a 40 minute game. Now, if KD had five more minutes, it would have been, I think probably, I I think it would have been a very different (laughs) outcome because he got hot towards the end where like, I was like, man, he ran out of time because he started just to take over. And like we've all seen KD do time and time again. Yeah. What, uh, after that victory, and then you had you had to Tokyo. Obviously, in in, in Tokyo, um, you guys kind of struggled to you, you know you were in every game that you played, had an opportunity oh to to win uh, just about every single one of them. What was that experience like? Actually, being over there. Uh, obviously, you talked a little bit about you know the feeling of representing your country, but like the actual yeah. you know day in day out of of being an Olympic athlete this year in in a year that was really kind of you know, derailed because of COVID as well. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, we had the, we've had a history of like some organizational issues in terms of just our, the simple stuff, bro. Like the travel, like it took us 30 hours to get there. Like that was, that was a, you talk about adversity and a hurdle itself. Like we went the opposite direction. We flew to, to Germany, I think first where layover for eight hours and then right. flew from there to Tokyo. We land. It's like, get your bags and we got to get to the ceremony, like quick shower, get to the ceremony. And it was like, basically from when we got there, it was like, everything was on 10, man. We were rushed. We had some issues with our staff and then getting passes into the village. Like me and me and Epe actually did a whole practice plan day before the game. We played Australia, our first game, me and Epe pretty much ran practice. Obviously, you know, the guys were, were great about it. It was a group effort. But me and Epic were sitting there in the cafeteria, like, well, so we're going to do this first or that first? Like, and then we got to get to this and we should go over there, ATOs. Like, and we're trying to break down to get ready to play Australia, who at this point now was ranked number one in the world. And that's like our opening right. match. And it was like, we had some adversities from basically from the minute we left the States that we had to, to get through and get over um, that, you know, got in the way a little bit. Just a, I don't want to say like a full excuse of why we didn't play well, but definitely a unneeded distraction. Yeah. Um, but the day to day within Tokyo was interesting, man. Like the COVID testing, the we did the the, the drool one, the saliva yeah. test. Yeah. There was one big old mess hall that you could go eat at. Um, and from what I've heard about the Olympics, is you can kind of tour the city and do whatever you want, essentially. And, and naturally, we were unable to do that. We we're pretty restricted to the village, um, which had it pro, has its pros and cons. Obviously, you get to mingle with the other athletes and walk around and get to experience, you know, other other cultures in different ways. But uh, it was pretty cool overall. And the further away I get from it, the more I appreciate it. I'd say that's what I'm most interested by. The basketball stuff is cool. Don't get me wrong, but you're hanging out in a village with just a collection of the greatest athletes that walk this earth. That's got to, that's got to feel pretty cool. That's like, that's pretty good company to consider yourself a part of. It's, it's crazy because like, we like little things, bro. I don't want to say little things, but like things you wouldn't think of table tennis. It's like, we're walking around. We're like, yo, that's probably the, the fifth best table tennis player in the world. Right. You know, like not just like this guy plays ping pong. (laughs) Like, no, he's the best in the world. And, there was a girl that was on our flight that did like the, what's it called? Like the the track event where you do like 10 different things. And she's like, I've been number one in the world. Decathlon. She's been number one in the world for three years straight. And if you look at this woman, bro, like the most unsuspecting woman you'd ever see. It's just like, she's the best in the world at what she does. Like, obviously she's not in the NBA on ESPN every day, has a camera in her face, social media going crazy. You know what I mean? It's not like, yeah. Like she's the best in the world for three years straight. Like you talk about domination at what you do. Like these are the kind of athletes we were around. And I think I saw it most when I just, I went to the weight room. They had that whole little weight room set up within the village. It was like multiple levels and you just see the way some of these people are working. And it's like, you know, some events don't necessarily have a coach, you know, it's like, if you're, you're there just to throw a javelin, like, you might bring somebody, you might not. And they're just in there going through their daily routines, locked in. It was like, this is no, like incredibly inspiring just to see the way some people just carry themselves. Like I'm looking at them thinking like, I thought I was professional and the way you're right. 
carrying yourself has made me want to take everything to another level. It's it's interesting because like basketball is a game that obviously you need to be like locked in to perform at a high level, but there are some people that are just so talented that like they can basically do whatever they want and still get by with some of these other sports. It's like, you gotta be, because there's no like skill necessarily. I mean, there is skill, but it's like, you gotta be so locked in on your training in, in order to be at that level, like the top of the top. It's like, yeah. yeah. Some of it's just so technical. Like right, exactly. you'd wake up, exactly. I'd wake up in the morning and it was like boxing, for instance. I'd wake up in the morning, I look out my little window, and look we had like a tiny little balcony. I'd open the open the door, slide it open, and you'd hear the like the the gloves hitting as these boxers are just out in the courtyard at like six AM, bro. Just really full sweat, drenched, hoodie, like going through a full sparring session just in the middle of campus i guess you'd say like the courtyard and it's just like it's crazy. your commitment and you're you know you i get out of bed at nine o'clock i'm walking to get some food there's people that are just sprinting around the whole village like i, I do marathons like i just need to run 13 miles today i'm just like this is it's crazy your commitment level it made me feel like i wasn't committed and i feel like i'm a pretty committed disciplined guy and it was just like you guys are all taking this to a whole other level and it's like i said before it's just inspiring like just seeing the way People from all different backgrounds, different countries carry themselves. And it's like the boxer from the Philippines wasn't doing anything different than the boxer from Canada. You know what I mean? Like they are all equally just like committed to their to their tasks, to their passion. Like it was incredible. Yeah, I'm I'm curious, man. I and and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but you know, for those that that don't maybe know your story, like you have certainly a a roundabout you've gone a roundabout way to get to where you are right like you were you were a, a really good player coming out of high school but you know weren't some surefire high major guy definitely weren't a surefire nba player coming out of a ucsb for you and, and you i think you've touched on some of this stuff already but like what do you feel like has been your separator in, in terms of getting to where you are right now in, in your career i uh it's funny you ask that because I've been asked that by younger guys a lot, especially guys in high school, right? Like in middle school that are randomly asked, like, what did you do that was different? And I think like something that gets underappreciated is just focus. I think a lot of people just lose focus, whether it's they get caught up in what's going on around them. They get caught up in the attention. Uh, but and I think I think a lot of people in the league can say this. Like, I know a lot of people that was better than me growing up. That it's like there's for whatever reason you're not in the position I am, and you got distracted at some point or something happened that led you astray. And it's, it's not an easy thing to stay focused. It's not easy to stay focused for 48 minutes of a game. You know what I mean? I, like it's it's not easy at all. And I think you you have to add that to the hard work, to the discipline. And there's so many things that need to go right to end up in this situation that you, you can't take any of it for granted. But I think just trying to stay focused as much as possible, whether it was like skipping that party in high school or um, not going out as much as I got through college or got to the G League or just an extra night of shots or waking up early in the summers and trying to get an extra workout in to try to just like be better than the ominous other guy out there that I'm trying to beat. You know what I mean? It's I think it's just little things like that and just constantly trying to find ways to challenge yourself that have helped me get to where I'm at. For sure. And and I think it also just piggybacking off of that. I think it also makes it so much easier to focus when you know what it is you're focused on. Right. And that I think, I think you've always, uh, obviously we, you know, we go back a little bit further than the heat. We knew each other before that, but we don't go way back, but I imagine you've always protected your dream of playing at this level. And, And despite what anyone would say that, that, that was what you were focused on, you know, playing at the highest level and, uh, I got to give you a ton of credit because you've you've manifested it. You've made it happen. I appreciate that. You know, there's definitely been some uh, heated inter- encounters that I've had defending what I was I was about to go do, and um, thankfully it worked out because I would have hated to have to tell them they were right. You know, and um, right. but it's been fun, man. It's been a grind. Uh, speaking of focus, I think one thing that requires a lot of focus is um, you know getting to the spot early, taking charges. The Heat have led this, the you know the NBA all year in taking charges. You guys are like 
you know, really you've, you've drawn your line in the sand. Like, this is what we're going to do. This is our identity. When you look back on this season, Gabe, do you have like a favorite charge that you've taken this year? I have a favorite charge that got overruled. What was that? My charge most recently against uh, LeBron that <laughs> me and him were arguing for quite a little bit about walking down the court, arguing it. They challenge it. Me and him are going back and forth about it during the challenge. And, you know, in LeBron fashion, he wins the challenge. Right. Um, and I'm fouled out of the game. And, you know, I, I finished the rest of the game on the on the bench, cheering my guys on. Um, I'm still convinced it was a charge. You know, I, I told him at the end, I said, my last name was different. You know, it'd be a charge. <laughs> you know, but I, I, I'm convinced it was a charge. I'm just going down as my favorite so far. Uh, Hold on. My, my high school coach definitely instilled that in me. Do you know, you know what Davis was doing there? He's trying to instigate because he wanted you to reference the Anthony Edwards charge that was entirely my fault because I got. Oh, back I know. That's why I completely <laughs> avoided it and threw LeBron out there. I'm like, you know, here's a bigger name. Let me just throw Bron because I and got get out of this Anthony Edwards. Because what he wanted to do is he wanted you to blame me for <laughs> getting. Duncan, I'm still mad at you about it a little bit. I'm not gonna lie to you. I tell you the memes. I still get stuff on social media about that dunk. Bro. It was his fault. Which, first of all, I'm gonna say this though, Anthony Edwards. That was an incredible athletic oh, feat. I ridiculous. didn't even know he made the dunk. All I know is I I tried to get there, take the hit, just trying to do my job. You know, just trying to be a professional, like I like to consider myself. Take the hit, and I hear the crowd go crazy. I'm like. I don't know what happened up there, but it must have been amazing. I see the replay. I looked at, at D-Mac, Dwayne. I said, bro, he made that, didn't he? He said, it was incredible. I, at that point, I said, I said, that was the most athletic thing I've ever witnessed like or been a part of. Unbelievable, but it was a charge. It didn't you know, count. Like, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, didn't count, but unbelievable. It's a turnover. All yeah, it is is a turnover. It's a loud turnover. We're going the other way. We're going the other way. Oh. Uh, Davis, you are for you to try to put him in that. I can't believe that happened though. Hey, that was crazy. He, he answered yeah, LeBron. That, he me. answered that's LeBron, and I was going to let it be. I wasn't going to push. You're you're a solid individual. You're a great. I, I right peeped at Dunk. I was I tried to avoid it. Well, <laughs> yeah, super super shady. Um, all right. Well, I hate ending on that negative energy, uh, but but nonetheless, I mean, you've brought nothing but but positive vibes. So there's been a lot of positive energy uh, exuding from this yeah. screen. Uh, GV, I, I, I just want to thank you for for coming on, man, taking the time. Uh, once again, I'd like to reiterate that chain is just glistening. Yeah, honestly, there. Dunk, it's just fantastic. where does he where does Gabe rank in our most handsome guests? He's got to be top three. <laughs> I'm top three. I'm not three for sure. <laughs> top three, he's not three. I don't know, Dave. I'm gonna let you figure that one out. Uh, <laughs> you, you, can take, you can take some. You can take some time to uh, you know pour through. I mean, the look data. at him, Pico uh, chain. <laughs> look at the teeth. You know, it's, it's this quick side story, man. My first time in Miami, Duncan was really the only guy I knew on the Heat through JD, our, our the three of us mutual friend here. And, you know, naturally I hit him immediately when I got there. I'm like, yo, what's up? He's, you know, Duncan trying to be a, a he might have been a rook at that time, Duncan. I really don't know what your status was. I was a young was. fella. I was a young fella. Young fella. Treat me like he was the vet already. Just like a, a young fella come kick it with me. I'm just like, all right, man, like, I don't know what we're going to do, but it sounds great. We go get some tacos. He took me to this store called Scotch and Soda. Never looked back. This is basically most of what I'm wearing these days is Scotch and Soda. They've been taking great care of me ever since Doug uh, made that introduction. Good. Well, this is a this is a great opportunity to shout out uh, Nick from Scotch and Soda. Absolutely, Nick. You're uh, a real one. He's hooked us up a handful of times. Uh, love Scotch and Soda. Great brand. The thing is now I can't step inside Scotch and Soda without them being like, oh, yeah, Gabe was in here earlier. Mm. So <laughs> everything everything that I walk in and potentially buy, you've probably already had your hands on. That's a, a problem. little bit of a concern. Last time – Last time I was in there, Doug, they said, hey, look, I can't let you get this. Tyler got it. I said, I better get everything else before someone else gets something. <laughs> I went a little crazy. I will be honest with you. We can collaborate on, you know, days that, you know, we'll go in there. You can get this. I'll get that. We can figure it out. But I'm, you know, you turn me on to scotch. I'm in there heavily now for sure. But that's that's really what it is. Like I, I went in right before we went on this road trip and, you know, we're packing for 12 days, whatever it is. And it's like, oh yeah, Gabe got that, 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 and I he's like going went in down there that morning. Line. Yeah, I went in there that morning. It was like 10 a.m. I texted him. I said, Nick, I'm on my way. 
I had no idea when they opened, you know, and he's like, I'll be there in 20 minutes. I said, great, you know, perfect. No, and Nick I went is, crazy just before they opened. It was perfect. Nick is as real as they come on. Uh, if you haven't checked out Scotch and Soda, this yeah, is a what shameless is this? plug. We are this not getting turning paid into an advertisement. Uh, to do this, but I do, I do, I do love Scotch and Soda. They make great stuff. Um, anyways, uh, Gabe, I started that, man. I apologize for that. <laughs> no, yeah. no, I'm happy it went there. I'm really, I'm really happy it did. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. Your, your story is inspiring. Uh, you know, the, the way you approach life day to day is inspiring as well. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you just sharing your, your knowledge, your wisdom and your, uh, your experiences. I, I think that many, uh, many people will take a lot from this. So thanks for coming on the long shot, man. We appreciate you. I appreciate you guys, man. Happy to be invited, happy to be a guest, happy to be involved. And I'd love nothing more, but to get back on here one day. Wow. I'm thinking we do something in person, maybe get Max into the fold, the four of us just run it up. Um, That'd be incredible. You know, maybe find a nice off night, you know, or maybe we could, you know, mix in maybe some vino as well, you know, just have a good time. Don't tempt me with a good time, Diva. I know, I know. Uh, Just throwing it out there. Maybe an off season thing. Who knows? Uh, Ah. Anyways, thanks for for coming on, man. You're the man. And uh, keep letting that thing fly, eh?